I'm not reviewing the new Orbital album until my CD copy arrives. I'm told that's not going to be for another week. But in the meantime, hello everybody. Welcome to The Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. Uh, and today I am talking about album number seven from Music. Duntisborn Abbott's Soulmate Devastation Technique. <laughs> right, getting back on track with my series on Mike Paradinas, and uh, we've reached a particularly strange moment in his catalog that I, I don't even really know how to introduce. I suppose if there's one thing that might set this project apart without actually listening to it, it's that this is probably the music album that gets talked about the least. It obviously wasn't in his classic era anymore, just as with Billy's Paths, he released it independently on his Planet Mew label, and while I don't think it was especially poorly received or anything, I never really see anyone, like, talk about it or bring it up these days. It kind of awkwardly sits as a bit of like a weird one-off black sheep in his catalog. So why is that, and does it deserve to be forgotten, as it seems to have been left on the side of the road to die like the body on the album cover? Well, in my opinion, no. I think this album's quite solid and another reminder of how creative Paradinas can be, though at the same time, it's not hard to figure out why this one isn't brought up too often. Because, man, is it a weird off-brand moment for him that doesn't sound like anything else he ever did before or since. And a particularly difficult one to digest just by itself. It may be made up out of all the same ingredients you'd expect out of a music album, like your standard retro-melodic synth textures and crunchy beatwork, but Paradinas always had like a bit of a playful edge to his sound that showed up through nearly all of his work, and this might be his first album to completely ditch that playfulness altogether. Dante's Born Abbots is not a fun album in any way, it is intentionally very unpleasant, very dark, very unnerving. A lot of contemporary reviews pulled out the adjectives nauseous or nauseating, including the promo text currently on the album's Bandcamp page. The melodies, while still always present, got way more dissonant and spooky than they ever did before. I've seen a couple of reviews mention offhand that this album might have even been inspired by a breakup that Paradinas had recently gone through, hence that overwhelmingly bleak tone and the soulmate devastation part of the title. But at the same time, there's another aspect to this album that makes it particularly stand out to me in his catalog, aside from merely being his darkest album. If one is to look over the track listing, they'd see an album that is about normal length at almost exactly an hour, but is crammed with a lot of shorter tracks, 17 in total, mostly averaging to two or three minutes each, with only a couple near the end starting to stretch past five. And if you listen to the album, or even just randomly preview through it, there's a sense of the album starting to run together a little bit. Uh, you start to lose your way within it, and if you pay close enough attention, you actively start to hear certain melodic motifs repeatedly showing up multiple times, with several tracks that seem almost copied off of each other, with some minor tweaks. Be it the melody from opener Prong Seamness being twisted into slightly different shapes on later tracks Pons, Pons, and Insomnia, uh, grooves and progressions from the track Dexedrine Girl being repurposed into the track Dirty Lush Stink Wife. Or just the fact that there's a pair of tracks called Eggshell and Eggshell 2, which are in fact just two different versions of the same track. I've seen some people really mark this point against the album to the point of calling it underdeveloped or undercomposed as a result. But I think such takes may have missed the point, as I feel uh, what, may, what this album was really meant to be all along is a fake film soundtrack. That is what the structuring of this album reminds me of above all else, playing off typical soundtrack album tropes of smaller incidental cues with repeating motifs as if it was his equivalent to, say for instance, what Air did with The Virgin Suicides. It's an album which feels like it was entirely designed to play in the background of a low-budget horror slasher movie which doesn't exist, and in that way, I honestly thought its overall execution was a lot more clever than is typically given credit for. Again, it was just not an idea I ever saw among the artists in the IDM scene that Paradinas came up in, and it gets extra points for me for that uniqueness and how well it was able to stick to that concept, while substantially fleshing it out in such a way that still felt like a proper music album. Uh, and not a side venture as soundtrack albums often are. Granted, that concept does also lead to an album that probably won't get much of any representation in a list of, like, my favorite individual tracks from him. 
it's definitely more of a project I appreciate more for how it comes together as a complete whole than I do for any individual part of it. It's not an album rich with big standout tracks. But, you know, that isn't going to stop me from breaking it down in that manner anyway, as I always do. I think the album does start out pretty strong with its above-mentioned opening cut, Prong Seamness. Prong Seamness, I, how, I don't know how you say that. Uh, it's the perfect tone setter and uh, fittingly feels like the main titles or opening credits for the experience you're about to get into, introducing a lot of the sounds that you'll be hearing throughout the project, from its wiry, organ-like melodic leads, to its skittering beats and lumbering bass, and sinking you right into the unnerving Halloween-ready mood the entire album creates. One of those tracks that you might not know what to think of when you first hear it, but slowly grows on you more and more with each return visit. From there, the album slowly shifts around from lower key tracks primarily built around their melodies to other tracks which get a bit heavier in their beatwork. In the former category, we have material like the sort of title track Duntus Born Abbots, which has a particular Boards of Canada-esque emptiness but still conveys one of the warmer melodic progressions here, though uh, not as warm as either of the Eggshell tracks. Between the two versions, I think I just prefer the first version over its sequel, which doesn't change much aside from adding in a longer and hazier intro, maybe getting a tiny shade more dissonant in its melodies, more midi drums, I don't know. <laughs> and on top of that, there's even a regular old ambient track right around the halfway point of the album in Strawberry Fields Hotel. Uh, itself easily the least unnerving cut in the bunch, maybe even slightly heartwarming and wouldn't have been out of place among the more lighthearted tones seen on some of Paradinus's previous albums. Though still fitting well in context, as a brief but melancholy respite next to the darker tones the rest of the album explores, especially exemplified by the immediately following cut, Pons Pons, which completely contrasts that track's tone, uh, made up of all the same laid-back melodic ambient textures, uh, with maybe a very light hip-hop beat, but delivering some of the most unnerving and dissonant and warped chords and melodies the album has to offer. And as mentioned before, some of the motifs in this track are warped even more in the track Insomnia, which combines the same mix with some thicker beat work. But in terms of those similarly heavier cuts, uh, there's just tracks like Woozy, which hits you with some cloudy ambience that immediately lives up to the track's title, but then breaks into some much heavier stomping percussion. Or Dexedrine Girl, which combines some thicker and more blood-pumping techno beats with some uh, more dissonant leads and unnerving chords, and a whole bunch of these samples which resemble coughing, I guess? Uh, and later on, as again mentioned above, this track's groove is repurposed into the track Dirty Lush Stink Wife, which does away with the coughing noises and replaced it with some smaller pitched-up voice snippets, which are less striking, but... I suppose still pretty neat. A bunch of my biggest favorite cuts on the album are also on that thicker beat heavy side. For instance, I'm especially partial to cuts like 2CV and its overbearing, uh, alternatively marching and squeaking percussion going up next to its wobbling bass and hazy chords. Also quite enjoy the track Something Else and its more standard and straightforward house-ish dance beats, uh, joining its comparatively cheery melodies. Only comparatively cheery. <laughs> also have to give special uh, mention to the thick and overwhelming acid wobbling and crunching distortion artifacts acting as percussion on Old and Tired. And speaking of acid, that also takes particular focus on Acid Steak Night. Uh, mostly a uh, very straightforward traditional acid techno kind of cut that goes right back to the old school 808 state new build approach to the genre. Also, this cut is the only track which features co-production from another artist. It's a collaboration with fellow Planet Mew signee Libby Floyd, aka The Doubtful Guest, so that's cool too. Though standouts like these are also contrasted with a couple of lowlights that don't do as much for me. I didn't really vibe with Rise of the Salmon uh, that much, and thought its various layers of melodic leads got a bit too overbearing and melodramatic. Or perhaps that's just all the MIDI crash symbols adding in a bit of cheesiness to the track that the rest of the album mostly avoided. Also wasn't crazy about the stabbing bass lines and muted chords on Payne's Hill Park. Tracks like these two are among the least pleasant in the bunch from a textural standpoint, but combine it with a tiny bit of sweetness that's not as easy to swallow or sink myself into, I guess? But neither of those are my least favorite moments here. That honor has to go to the closer, Drumlight. Admittedly, I do think this track is a very fitting way for the album to go out, and I assume other people can much more easily mark it as a highlight. It's definitely not a track you're going to just miss or forget. But the way it alternatively shifts between one of the most despondent loops of synth melodies yet, and full-on harsh noise, 
first hitting you with a straight up jump scare about two minutes in that throws me off every single time, going back to the melody loop and then fading in the noise a lot more gradually before every sound of the mix is completely obliterated into distortion artifacts. Again, for some people, I'm sure that's going to lead to one of the most emotionally intense parts of the whole album, and I certainly can't fault it for taking the horror movie soundtrack idea to its logical extreme. But, in, I don't know, it's just not really my idea of a fun time, I guess. But that's everything on Duntus Born Abbott's Soulmate Devastation Technique. I mean, I'm not going to say this is one of my biggest favorite projects from Paradiness ever. Uh, while I at least like the vast majority of tracks on here, I don't know if I can say I absolutely love any of them. It doesn't have any of my all-time favorite tracks from him, and in my inevitable ranking of his studio albums, this is going to end up in the lower half. Also, if someone's looking to get into Paradinas for the first time, this might very well be the single worst starting point you could possibly pick. While the sonic ingredients that go into it are indicative of what Paradinas usually does, it's so far away from his usual fare in terms of its overall tone and mood and just makes for such an intentionally unpleasant listen that I don't think really won him any new fans, let's put it that way. But at the same time, even if it is a terrible starting point, I still think any existing fans of Paradina still out to pick it up and listen to it at some point anyway. It is undeniable proof of his versatility that he can make an album as tonally off-brand as this work well even in a vacuum, and it's proof of his creativity as well. The whole idea of this fake horror movie soundtrack via standard IDM textures once again isn't an idea I'd ever seen before, and I think he really made the most out of that concept. It's not exactly a stone-cold masterwork, and I can definitely understand anyone who might mark this as a skip, but for me it's a reminder that even some of this guy's most overlooked work has plenty of quality to experience, and as such I can still give it my recommendation and the very respectable score of a 7.5 out of 10. But of course, this is all just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it by liking like your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters, they're awesome people. You want to add yourself to that list, link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.